sorry, we're a little late starting. We had one uh, of our contributors drop out at the last minute, and we're very grateful to have found a replacement at short notice on this very topical subject, which has been one that's been kicking around in Thailand for quite some time. Uh, just before we get going with tonight's programme, just to alert you to uh, a couple of things coming up. We've got a, um, a, a film tomorrow uh, showing at 7 o'clock, uh, which chronicles the impact of dams being built up in Kachin State. The whole issue of damming rivers in the upper reaches of uh, Southeast Asian countries is a very big one. And in Myanmar, arguably, particularly in a, a, a potential or half war zone like Kachin State, um, the impact is not not well documented. This film has spent, the filmmakers spent a very long time watching how local people were affected. Um, next week, um, on the uh, 27th of January, our next event is looking at how environmental crime is tackled with uh, three very strong panelists who've looked at different methods of trying to combat transnational crime. Tonight's panel discussion, um, I have to say there was about as much discussion about holding it at our board meetings as there will be tonight about the subject itself is the issue of what we might, we've titled it Sufficiency and Sustainability. Um, this has a long history. Uh, back in after the first of the most recent coups in Thai history, after 2006, the then government of then Prime Minister Suryod uh, Chulanon brought forward the sufficiency economy thoughts of His Majesty the King um, as a, an idea, a potential basis for economic policy. Um, it was also seen very much as an alternative to the philosophies of uh, former Prime Minister Taksin Shinawat, who believed very much in bringing the forces of capitalism right out into the villages. Um, the thoughts of uh, His Majesty the King were very much about restraint, about living within people's means, uh, thoughts that, that have been expressed in particular in the aftermath of the 1997 crisis. In the discussions we had at that point at the FCCT, we decided then not to have a panel. And the reason was because the philosophy was so closely associated with the king, it wasn't at all clear that people would feel comfortable saying anything critical. In fact, we weren't at all sure whether you would get, wouldn't get you a Les Majesty charge. And in the, the end, the decision was we can't have a panel discussion. When we debated holding it again this year, we felt that the ideas of what were the sufficiency economy have been pushed and developed by quite a number of Thai institutions and are now being promoted by the Thai Foreign Ministry overseas, that this has gone beyond simply being the ideas of the monarch. It is now being developed into a philosophy, and that's certainly the view the government wants to promote. It believes that these ideas now offer the basis of some alternative thinking at a time where arguably the global capitalist model that has dominated the world for the last 25 years is being questioned more than ever. So our feeling was that you can have a panel discussion, and I hope you all feel Tonight, you'll listen to our distinguished panelists who have a long experience in pushing these ideas forward, um, that you can ask questions and that you can be critical. We're discussing a philosophy that has gone beyond the original ideas of the king. And to put it simply so you feel at ease, if you feel critical or want to ask tough questions, please do. You will not be criticizing the royal family. Let's make that very clear. And I make it particularly clear because as so often is the case at our events, we do have I'm afraid officers from the NCPO here who monitor our events now, I don't want you to make, feel ner make you feel nervous. Um, they've always been very nice at our previous events and there's been no problems with them and we trust that will be the case tonight. Um, our panel of guests we've got tonight all have long experience in developing these thoughts uh, which were initially of sufficiency and we have to say sufficiency not self-sufficiency, that was always stressed, into broader concepts of sustainability. Arguably, Thailand is not exactly a showcase for sustainability when you look at the way in which people live in Bangkok uh, and, and the inequality and the sort of incredible wealth and the, the sort of environmental attitudes. But it doesn't mean people haven't been working very hard. Uh, our first speaker will be Dr. Priyanut Damapia. Um, she directs the Sufficiency School uh, Center at the Foundation of Virtuous Youth and also has worked on the subject in the past for the Crown Property Bureau, where a lot of these projects have been put into practice. Um, next in, uh, to, to speak will be Dr. Sumit uh, Champrasid. He's Secretary General of the Institute for the Sufficiency Economy um, and has been doing a lot of work also on developing those ideas. We're also very pleased to have Momluang uh, Dipanada Diskun here, who is the uh, Vice CEO of the Mei Fa Luang Foundation. Many of you will know its projects. It's a royal project up in uh, 
near Chiang Mai. They grow a lot of organic products. They try and involve hill tribes in uh, productive agriculture. Um, it was a project, of course, sponsored initially by uh, King Bumipon's mother, the prince's mother. Uh, and we're very pleased at very short notice uh, to have Dr. Ching Chai uh, Hanchanat here. He um, uh, has a lot of experience in working with government and international organizations, but has said he's here very much as a representative of the private sector. He's a vice chair of the Board of Investment, uh, works with the uh, uh, Taiwan Fund uh, company as well, and will give a perspective on how the uh, private sector and the business sector believes it can get involved in these notions of sufficiency and sustainability. Um, let's start first of all with you, Dr. Priyanut, who's going to give us an outline of how the original sufficiency ideas have developed over the last decade into something much broader. Dr. Priyanut. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, and thanks so much for the introduction. Um, I think I would like to start this way that um, I think probably we have heard the word sufficiency the first time in the year 1997, if all of us remember, when we had the Tom Yang Kum crisis, right? And then, um, but that's not the original uh, origination of uh, sufficiency economy philosophy that we are going to talk about today. Um, the king has, his majesty has mentioned that, you know, if you use sufficiency, economy, then we can um, you know, solve the, cri the uh, economic crisis at the time. And that creates um, an interest you know, of his majesty philosophy of development. And there was a working group. I'm just telling like, you know, a timeline of you know, what's going on about some economic philosophy, which I will call SEP. Um, there was a working group at the National um, Economic Social Planning at the NESDB that um, actually I was working in that working group too that we, ha we would like to know more about what His Majesty is, is talking or um, thinking about when he mentioned the word sufficiency economy because he said that he said about sufficiency for a long time about 20, 30 years ago and it was like a puzzle for us as academic you know so what happened is that we went to research and you know work on the definition of SEP, and we have uh, you know sending to His Majesty the King to have a look whether we have understand his thinking right or wrong. And this is the origination of the SEP as we know right now that you know the moderation and you know um, reasonableness or prudence, you know the self immunity which we have, you have, you have heard about, anyways. So we have asked permission from uh, the Office of Secretary General of uh, His Majesty to use the, this definition, when I said we this time, I'm talking about the NESDB, to use this definition that all of us maybe know about it, you know, these three principles and the ethics um, and um, knowledge, you know, virtues, conditions, to use these definitions as a guiding principles for Thailand's development. And that was the origination of Sumsi economy philosophy, which is SEP. And that's a story. It came out, but then as Jonathan has just mentioned that, um, you know, but I agree absolutely with Jonathan that not many Thai people really, you know, put into practice at the very first, you know, decades and not even really understand very well about service economy. I, I would like to just, you know, tell my personal story that I went to one seminar, you know, in Nongbo Lampu, like this is like, you know, the year like 2002 or something. And one village head stood up and he said that, he just, you know, uh, said the whole definition of SEP by himself. He memorized it and he asked, you know, whether we should use this as our, uh, you know, guiding principles for the development of the community. That was my first, you know, um, impression of how people perceive, you know, SEP in the rural area. But anyways, coming back to this, so, uh, and from that, we used that SEP definition in the national plan and other things that I think we will, we will hear about that uh, later. 
I just talk about my work a little bit that um, in the year 2007, that Jonathan just mentioned that we had the first you know, coup data. Well, not the first, <laughs> right? The, the second last. Well, maybe this, one, this time it's not the last anyways, but I don't know. Anyways, well, the second last if you come from this time. So, so should, I, should I call out 2007 coup data? Anyways, um, um, you know, Jonathan has mentioned really uh, rightly that um, you know, the government at the time really you know, put the development agenda based on some economy. And I was working on putting this into a curriculum, a national curriculum, which means that Thai students, you know, will learn about these principles, apply in, the, in their daily life from grade one to grade 12. We are not going to kindergarten or to university students yet, but anyways. Um, and that, from that, you know, I start working on how teachers, you know, can decide the learning activities so that students can learn. For example, you know, to me, I think sufficiency economy is about to achieve sustainability. It's about, because my background is economist, so it's about utilizing the resources, you know. How much is enough, not too much? For using, say, some materials, you know, to do some project for students, and you have to think in a reasonable way why they use, you know, this cup, not this cup, for example, and how they will plan prudently. So this is how we put it in the curriculum. To make Thai students have some guiding principles in their thought and in their life. We are not that successful, I know. It is so hard to do this <coughs> educational, you know, system. But we have uh, developed an uh, assessment system in the Thai education that if any school can start to, you know, utilize the sovereignty principles into their management of school, into the learning activities, and all other, you know, like communities, you know, uh, relationships, something like that, and if they can have some results, we will call them sovereignty-based school. And, you know, um, some of the work has been in, in this book that I think you, all of us, you know that. Uh, we get this book, right? Now we have about half, in Thailand we have 40,000 schools in Thailand, which is quite a lot. Um, we have about 18,000 schools right now that pass that assessment, which means that um, the principals, teachers, you know, adopt the sufficiency economy principles in their learning activities in school. It's not that great, but I talked to Jonathan that we are attempting to do something. At least, you know, if we are going to talk about sustainable development, it has to start from <coughs> mindset, the way we think, the way we utilize resources. And we have to start from cultivating, I just word cultivating the mindset of the future generations, which are, you know, those children and students first. And that's what I'm working on. <laughs> You know, so I think I help you already, Jonathan. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much, Dr. Priyanut. Um, Ajahn Sumit, perhaps you can fill in a little bit more about <clears throat> what the sufficiency economy has become. You know, how, much, how the ideas have developed and what we mean when, you, when you're discussing it in your institute, what you mean by it. Thank you, Jonathan. And I have to excuse myself because uh, since I spent the last uh, almost 15 years working with the grassroots people, I think this is maybe the third time I um, provide uh, English communication with uh, among English-speaking people. Mm -hmm. And it's really exciting for me, you know. Normally, if you speak in front of the guru, one guru is, you know, exciting enough. But today I have to speak you know, among the three gurus, so you, you can guess how excited I am. <coughs> so anyway, I think I start with uh, my direct experience to help the um, uh, industrial ministry to promote uh, the industrial standard on uh, sufficiency uh, 
industry standard, which uh, the project was uh, in 2002. There, there were two questions at that time. Uh, because at uh, those times, most of the people understand that sufficiency economy it involved only in agricultural area. So the people in the industry ask the question that how can we be differentiated? Because we are doing the industrial standard for sufficiency economy. What is the differentiation uh, from sufficiency standard uh, compared to the other standard? So we came up with a lot of discussion and then finally we agreed that uh, we should concentrate on human resource because every industry or business they say human resource is a key resource of their business or of the company but uh, have you made your people sufficient? Have you tried to uh, think of uh, how to help them to be sufficient? Then I carry out uh, you know, one small project among about 30 industry together, 30 company, you know, all in uh, production uh, arena. And then the same question. So we uh, we uh, having one workshop to clarify. The second question, how, how do we practice it in our, you know, business? If we want to be uh, sufficiency industry, how to practice. So we have a, a workshop uh, with uh, about 30, I think 30 plus people. They are uh, supervisor up level and came up with the same idea, how to practice. So then I start asking the question, uh, with your about 1,000 worker in the, in the company, uh, are they have sufficient uh, money to spend? How, how many percent of the people are in debt? Can you guess how many percent? More than 90 percent. Because uh, they're using the future money and they have to keep on paying the debt. House alone is 30 years uh, mortgage. So, and you know, among those with the higher cost of living and all that, so they are, most of them using the future money and you know, is uh, a neg negative result on their income. So, secondly, second question, uh, then you are not sufficient now. After retirement, how many years uh, would you uh, live and how much money do you need to be uh, just be able to have the same you know standard of living maybe a little bit low but how much money do you need per family to carry on until you die they start calculating uh, it's about two to three million depend on each family because they uh, will live about uh, 17 more year in average so, and how many people have two to three million preparing after retirement? Can you guess? Out of 1,000 people, how many people who said um, 50? No? 20? No? 10? Less than 10. Less than 10 people, not percent. 10 people. Then, what? How did you go? Where did you go after retirement? So, um, can you go back to your hometown, live to your own parent land, or uh, you have any solution? Less than 5% have solution. So, how to take care of the 95%? That's your job. If you could not make them sufficient now and sufficient uh, after retirement, don't say that you are on the sufficient economy industry because you said your human resource is the most important resource in your business. So then 
I ask next question. Because you are not farmer, you are not agriculture, but what you can make yourself more sufficient. Now, um, people earn money, I mean in that uh, factory, earn money and spend uh, the earning, 100% earning to make themselves sufficient, isn't it? So what can make you sufficient without money? Sell reliance. What can make you? So the, one of the supervisors said, Oh, this morning I came out from the one convenience store together with my subordinate and he carried uh, three bottles of wa drinking water. I asked him, uh, did you spend every day buying three bottles of drinking water? My, supervisor, my subordinate said yes. And it's seven baht per bottle, so 21 baht. That time, this worker has 210 baht uh, daily wage. How many percent? Ten percent only on drinking water. How can people survive? So he said, then, the, that's why I said, asked, then why don't we make ourselves sufficient for uh, cellular line on uh, drinking water by uh, us buying the, um, the spare part and then equip the strainer uh, to have the the purified water to drink uh, at work and also bringing home. So then the idea start. Next idea, you know, you know, one by one came up. Why don't we, you know, take all the scrap, the scrap food? Uh, you know, every day, every month, the factory have to spend more than ten thousand baht to just taking care of the scrap food. You know, get rid of those. So why don't we? produce, you know, shampoo out of the sea-based craft food like, you know, lemon, uh, mangoes, uh, orange, that can produce to shampoo and for porridge and all, you know, all kind of, you know, personal care stuff. And then the rest, uh, we asked the factory, can we borrow a small part, part of land, uh, backyard of the factory to um, feed some duck, you know? they feed 500 duck with 300 duck eggs every day to share to each other or go on and on on and on all the program oh, another thing another guy say you know after work we we go back home, home. and then after we go back home we uh, have to purchase everything you know from you know just one piece of chili we have to buy but I remember, you know, you just throw any uh, seed of the uh, chili, you, you get it easily. I mean, any place in the, in the house, you know, and, you know, then the idea come, you know, they propose some of the, uh, some of the manager who has the Japanese garden, change the Japanese garden to, you know, grow something that can be eat. So, uh, this idea come up and, you know, how many percent with this cell reliance program have saved the money expense up to 40 percent and these 40 percent have uh, been spent to take care of the debt of, you know the personal debt and the um, you know more more than that these people have practiced how to be cell reliance in their own context. They don't need to, you know, go a big farm, uh, uh, rice farm, but in their own context, not necessarily only food things, but, you know, they practice this behavior in their life and it carry on to their family. They have a weekend activity, uh, doing things together and that help the, uh, increase the happy, happy in, the, in the family. So this, these are just the example that um, in, I think in, in uh, any, uh, anywhere else in the world, people, you know, have chip, the people chip uh, from 100% agriculture living to urbanize, right? And then to 100% uh, city life. This means with they chip from 100% self-reliance 
or almost 100 percent to uh, you know a combined self reliance plus they still staying in their home having um, enough uh, basic need to to eat but they you know they time they go to work in the factory they get some extra cash isn't it so then the cash they get is an excess of cash then once they move from their house and live alone in the you know in the city life means they only they only sufficient by a hundred percent of earning not not a combination anymore so this is why uh, in Thailand now I think we have daily 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 uh, worker and you know monthly salary worker all together almost 40 million almost 40 million people and these 40 million people they are the same as that 1000 factory people when they uh, retire after they retire because Thailand approaching uh, you know aging society how can the government take care of this because the social uh, security fund uh, within 30 years it will be zero the inflow rate you know only uh, taking money from the new you know apply applicant but the income utilized uh, from the from the fund is lower than the outflow so we are counting the day when the money is gone how can we take care of uh, all the you know salary men uh, people after they retire because our uh, tax base of the of the society is so small so if we don't provide the new behavior of the people to be self uh, reliance by themselves which is the basic of the uh, uh, sufficiency economy the king uh, provide a speech uh, on his birthday one of the birthday that sufficiency economy one one thing that uh, we don't talk much is to you know uh, eat what you grow and you know to to have the basic need uh, on your own that uh, I think that attitude have been disappear from our Thai society so we are promoting that back uh, right now so this is uh, what I call the difference between the you know I have done a lot of mistake because I came from capitalist I am 100% capitalist uh, I was until I I retire and then I you know I was very uh, very young retirement person I retired uh, with the age of 42 because I start working uh, you know very young I start working because my father passed away and I have to feed myself and you know uh, support myself in education so I told myself since I was young that I will retire at the age 40 because I start 15 years more than uh, earlier than other people so after I retire I spend a lot of time study and you know to provide the, the, the right solution and then because I came from capitalist I, I, I like the, the philosophy very much but because I came from capitalist I keep on teaching people uh, how to get money to be sufficient and you know I, I was the one who started up the SME bank at the, that time the stati statistic uh, show that out of 100% to be incubate to be an entrepreneur do you know how many percent success proper incubation 9% how can we uh, ask our farmer and agriculturist which they are born SME isn't it they are they are the the uh, most number of SME in Thailand but unfortunately we don't call them SME, SME so if we want to promote this philosophy uh, throughout the country I think we need to also uh, 
have some policy support. First of all, we have to call farmer and agriculture agriculturist SME. Now we don't count them. So if we don't count them, what what we uh, didn't uh, take into consideration in uh, GDP, their investment is not in private investment. So how on earth the you know the uh, officer will promote them because they don't get the score. Their investment never count. For example, if they grow, if they um, build them by themselves, it's not count in investment. If they grow the tree every year, growing, never count into GDP. But the stock of the uh, beer, alcohol, count in the GDP. The country will promote what? And when you grow the tree, you don't count the GDP, but you cut the tree, uh, uh, then you count the GDP. People will, will grow or will cut. Ajahn so, Sumit, can I, can I just stop you mid-flow there so we yeah. can get going? It's very interesting. We'll pick it up in the questions. Um, Mom Luang Panadai, if you just, uh, this Panadai, can you just tell us a little bit about the work at uh, Mefa Luang and, and how that reflects the, the philosophy? Okay. Good evening. Um, just wanted to make some correction. Um, I, you, you are certainly right by saying that we are close to Chiang Mai. We are actually in Chiang Rai. Right. <laughs> not so close. <laughs> and we, we don't actually sell vegetable. We have coffee and macadamia and handicraft <laughs> products. Um, but uh, my father told me that not to trust anyone, to always rationalize. So I have difficulty understanding sufficiency economy. Today, I still do. I, the particular thing I don't understand is the three rings and the two conditions. I think it's very difficult to understand. And also the notion that sufficiency economy only works in underdeveloped countries is something that is also wrong. Uh, I spend a lot of time trying to see for myself and understand it from a different perspective. So here, I mean, I don't have a whole lot of things to share with you. I'm probably one of the youngest. Oh, one thing I do want to say is I do plan to retire at the age of 40. I am now 41. <laughs> so things are not going as planned. Um, <clears throat> I look at the world today, and you know, uh, Jonathan was saying something about the widening gap between the rich and the poor, income inequality. Um, you know, female empowerment, um, you know, what, what's um, environmental degradation, I, might, might I add, um, war, uh, economic colonization. I think we all know this, and I think you talked about it too. So if you look at it from a global perspective, let me ask you, do you think like we need to change the model a little bit? Do you really think that capitalism is, is working? Why do you think Bill Gates and Warren Buffett donated, like Mark Zuckerberg donated over 90% of their assets away for us to, to charity? I've, and personally, I've never seen a billionaire in Thailand who, when they get to the third generation, have a happy family. They're always fighting amongst one another. So these are questions that I ask, right? And I don't read a lot, but I talk a lot, so I learn from, from talking. Uh, there are also other models that people are looking at. You know, you're talking about um, creating share value uh, versus you know, capitalized uh, capitalism. It, um, there's a book called Sacred Economy by Charles Einstein. Um, I read the front page, the, the cover and, and the back cover. It's very interesting. I recommend you all, you know, read it. When 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 you finish, you know, please contact me and, and give me a brief summary. <laughs> it's also social social enterprise concept, social business concept. There are different models, all trying to address the current theme, the global issue. Right? I went to World Economic Forum a year ago in uh, Indonesia, and um, they said that we like the developing countries are using our natural resources as if we have about 
planet to live off of. Now, if we include Europe and America, the figures become three. So, you know, I would say that there are more underdeveloped countries than there are developed countries. And if we are accounted for 1.5 and the developed countries account for one point, another 1.5, then we have a problem. Because right now, people look at underdeveloped countries as those who created issues, like Thailand. We burn the forest. Yes, we burn the forest. But who consumed the product that we use to generate corn, to feed the livestock, to export to what countries, right? And are we going to play the economic game of quotas, catching you doing something bad? No. The, the, the real issue is we need to look for a new model. Now, to me, I believe that sufficiency economy is one of the new model. It is something that we have to really try to understand and try to grasp the concept. It's very common sense. When you talk about poor man or live within your means, it's not about to go farm. I mean, I would die if I started farming today, right? Or you talk about reasonableness. You're talking about having whom uh, kum kan, what's that? Prudence. Immunity. Immunity, right? Immunity from what? From whatever might happen. Economic crisis, tom yam kung, hamburger effect, subprime, euro crash. Right? That's what it's, it's all about. It's about common sense. How do we, as, 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 as a person, learn? and do something in order to do that. And keep keeping in mind the goal that do we really want to see uh, uh, the next three generation have to go to Mars? I mean, you've seen the Martians. I mean, he has to science the crap out of, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, really? Like, we, we're thinking about going to Mars as opposed to fixing the planet? Uh, that, that's my question, right? So, to me, um, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you my definition of sufficiency economy. It's about balance, personal balance, okay? I eat food. I eat good food, but I don't eat excessively, excessive good food. Don't let my body uh, tell you otherwise. I just have bad metabolism, <laughs> okay? And sufficiency economy can be done in the city. I taught my kids that if you want new toys, you can have your new toys only on your birthday. But you have to give your old toys away because there's no need to build closets, cabinets of toys. You only play with a certain amount of them. Same with clothes. I told myself, if I want to buy a new jacket, I have to get rid of my old jacket. I think that to me is, is, is living uh, within my own means. Don't create burden for other people. You know, don't be a bad person. Don't, don't corrupt. Don't say bad thing about people. Be positive. Always giving people the chance, the opportunity to do good. Don't create debt that you cannot pay. Right? So these are common sense. You go to Harvard, they teach you about that. You go to Hong Kong, they teach you about that too. So to me, that's how it's about how you interpret the concept and how you adapt it into your own life. At the end of the day, it's about how you want to live your life and what kind of person or personal choice do you want to make. And that to me is, is, is pretty much the uh, overall definition of a uh, sufficient economy. Now, one last point. If you add all that up, if you add all the people who have decided to change their behavior into a group of 10, a group of 1,000, a group of 100,000 or a group of millions, you actually have, you actually address another issue, which is human security. Right? So that's to me is what sophisticated economy is. It's about how we choose to live our lives. And if we can have more of us who choose to change our, our own lives, to protect the world a little bit more, to, to, to not go all out with greed, then we have ourselves a community of changed people and a safe and secure world. Thanks. Thank you very much. Our last speaker tonight.
Dr. Jingjai is going to speak from the uh, business community, I hope, with that yes. perspective. Uh, yes, despite already mentioned uh, the, the uh, Hokan Tawa, I will just speak on behalf of the, the private sector. But uh, first of all, when you the talk about sufficiency economy, I would like to mention four names here, in, not in this room. Um, the first is Kun uh, Jilayu. Uh, you know, she's from the Cloud Corporation, you work with him. The second person is the Dr. Sumet Dantivechikun, the Secretary General of the uh, Chai Patana. The third one is Kun Achan uh, Kasem, who is now the, the Privy Councillor. And the last one, also a very good friend of mine, his father, this, <laughs> this Banat father. So as you can see, I'm not his generation. Uh, and among the, the four uh, person, I think three uh, would be a, a bit of what uh, philosophy, the, the theory of uh, sufficiency economy and try to propagate that. But Mamlach uh, Chowong did not die, your father is probably the one who had put this into practice and you know through the foundation to so they have this uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, philosoph from philosophy the uh, concept to the implementation actually this uh, sufficiency economy is it's not something very very new you heard about Schumacher before small it beautiful the the, uh, in the agricultural practice, you have this, what the Ford Foundation keep promoting it, multiple cropping. So all these is all these elements, all these factors are already there. But our king is very far-sighted and is a visionary. So he just put this, all this uh, together, and that becomes the genesis of the sufficiency economy. When it start. Um, I think the private sector uh, had problem to understand what is really the uh, sufficiency economy. It, uh, does it mean that I mean the Thai company should not expand to become a, a multinational uh, corporation, or we just uh, limit our growth? But I think uh, with the different economic crisis in the past. I think our private sector, that I can tell because I'm, I'm now also vice president of the Board of Trade. I used to work with the government for 10 years. I worked with international organization for 23 years. I would now work with the private sector for 17 years. Don't be surprised. I'm quite old, but I am look young. Because that's my advantage. I look younger than him, <laughs> even though I'm his father's generation. So I, I, I got to you know, see all this come uh, up together, uh, different uh, segments of the society. And uh, they come to realize that, uh, as Dr. Smith said, uh, Capitalist, uh, uh, materialist, capitalist is not the answer. What the answer is the share capitalist. If you would like to look at the sustainability, it has to be share capitalist. And the base of or the pillar of sustainability is really sufficiency economy. But it doesn't mean that it's a limit to growth. No, no, that no sense to the private sector and to me, I can I see the sufficiency economy as the basis for fair business practice. I think that is very important. And we at the private sector, we start to understand that you know if we to survive we have to adopt this uh, fair business practice. I mean, the companies, whether big or small, SME or multinational, just like fish in the pond. You know, big fish, small fish. And the, pond, the water in the pond is just like society. If the water is polluted, all fish die. Doesn't matter whether big or small. So that the 
kind of the sustain that the sustainability, the fair business practice based on sufficiency economy or sustainability would help to keep the water clear and everybody survive. You know, we are talking, if I refer back to this uh, uh, book by Topfin way back, you know, they're talking about the third wave. The third wave, you know, they have first wave, second wave, and third wave. I mean, first wave, agriculture, and then come industrial revolution, and then you have the IT. I think the fourth wave they're talking now is the innovation, you know, the all what you are using now, the apps and all this. But I think if the economy, if I cannot speak uh, for the other country, but if Thailand is going to survive or sustain, we have to move into the fifth wave. And that is the sufficiency economy. And the economy, uh, kind of the care economy, with the, uh, I, I, I think with it, what you call it, altruism and spirit, you know, as uh, uh, advocated by Mathieu Ricard, the French philosopher who became monk, Buddhist monk in Tibet. He talked about the altruism. So I think we have to move toward that. And but how to translate that idea of a, a kind of philosophy into practice? Well, it's quite simple. You have to look at the micro-economic level, the micro-economy, the community economy, what you call it grassroots, but I would prefer to call it micro. And see how you, know, you can build up uh, SME at the community level. For, uh, you, you have to be realistic. They cannot just self-start by themselves. So this is where the private sector should come in, where we have to, trans to transform whatever what you call the charity uh, uh, program or the CSR, you see, into a concrete uh, act, uh, program what I would call it, social, social enterprise. And this social enterprise can be based on the principle of uh, sufficiency. You see, you have a community co-invest in a company and the private sector also, you know, is there to also help with equity funding and technology and management skill. So that's how you can build, you know, this so-called micro, micro economy and that it will uh, scale up to the na national level through the supply chain or, where, uh, or whatever. Uh, but we have to admit that this government saw this uh, as a very important policy. So they have created the 12 subcommittee of the, uh, the public-private partnership and also the civil society and what they call it, Pachalat the na na nation state, actually. So with this uh, idea of uh, a partnership, we are going to implement this, uh, what you call it, SME, you know, we call it the micro uh, enterprise at the community level. And perhaps, you know, uh, we can then transform, you know, our uh, uh, agriculture, based on just the raw material into the value added economy. We have sample, we have uh, the model, you know, uh, created by the foundation, my Falun Foundation, the Doikam uh, project, the products uh, and all this. So I, I do think that, you know, we come to the stage where we are quite confident that we now can internalize inter inter the sufficient economy. Recently, in December, we organized a, a study tour from a, a group of students uh, from UBC in Canada who we'll really come and look at the sufficiency economy. I have the uh, upon to interact with them. Actually, the, the group leader, a very close friend of mine, uh, Peter Boudreau, I think, Lola, you're also uh, participate in the group and the I think the feedback is very positive. It's about, I think that we can move forward with this uh, international 
what I call internationalization of the sufficiency economy. Thailand is now chairman of G77. So the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is now trying to bring in this uh, sufficiency economy into this, uh, you know, the working of the G77. And this is where we can move forward. You know, it's not uh, a state, uh, a static uh, philosophy. It's an evolving philosophy which, you know, from uh, La Pangse, you know, the concept into the implementation. So this is what I call the fifth wave in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I'd like to give a round of applause to our panelists. The floor is now open to anybody who'd like to ask questions. There's a microphone right over there in the center of the floor if anybody would like to ask some questions. Um, if I could just use my privilege sitting right next to a microphone and have to walk to it now to I'll put a couple of points to the whole panel actually that, that crop came up to my mind as I was listening. The first is what I've heard tonight from all four of you are wonderful notions about how people should live their lives, how they should plan properly, live within their means. But I haven't heard anything that sounds like a new economic model. I've just heard the kind of common sense advice that you would expect to hear, frankly, anybody giving any family or any business. Is it any more than that? The second thing is, why should the rest of the world take Thailand seriously promoting this when, when they look at Thailand, both the businesses, when you think about the massive land holdings of giant businesses like CP Group and, uh, and uh, TCC um, and the sort of excesses that go on in Bangkok, the sort of luxury focus of groups like Central, and the behavior of South Thailand's very, very top people, why would people take you seriously, the rest of the world, going out and promote, promoting this? Thank you. May I? Whoever wants to go first. Well, yes. <laughs> you refer to the... The, the, the private sector mm. and those, you know, those tycoon I'm, uh, I'm working with <laughs> at the Board of Trade. I would say that, you know, uh, I mean, if why you, you say that, uh, you know, we should adopt this, uh, the, the so-called sufficiency economy uh, and then uh, look at time. You see, we are not the, as I say, the genesis of sufficiency economy went back uh, long. But the King, our king is the one who has this uh, visionary and try to, um, you know, put package this, uh, and he's been trying on his uh, all his life. So it's not it's it it's not that easy, you know, to change the mentality or the behavior, and uh, we are just, you know, it's like a journey. You know, uh, and the sufficiency economy, the democratic regime, uh, this is, is a destination. But right now, I think we are uh, on the journey to the destination. So we have to pay attention to the journey that we can just keep on moving and not fall down or, you know, uh, got the... Uh, the uh, when uh, go to the, the the wrong track, so I think that's the journey which we are doing now, and the other country will probably have to do the same. Uh, I don't think that there's any country in the world who can say they have a perfect economic system, perfect political system. You no, know, all country they also on the journey, but some. Uh, slower, some are faster. So you have to to take that into consideration. We are perhaps a slow mover, but we are moving. And this is what I call it, the process of growing pain. Thank you. Um, the comments from the rest I, of the panel, yes. Um, I'm I, I really impressed with uh, what Dr. Xinxai mentioned about the fifth wave. I think this is like, you know, quite strong statement for some economy, but uh, I would like to um, get to what Jonathan has just asked. Um, why would other countries follow Thailand? Um, I think that's not a question that we can answer. <laughs> you know, it, it's a question that other countries should answer, first of all. 
But um, in this book, and Nicholas Grossman, who is the editor and writer is here, he, he, he put many things in the, in the book, the source book that I think you know, all of you will get it later. Um, one sentence, actually, I have to tell you, Nick, that I just love only one sentence that you wrote, the whole book. <laughs> he said that, um, you know, Thailand has its own sustainable development framework, and it's called sufficiency economy. I think we just said the whole thing about what we are doing and what we can, you know, talk about Thailand when we go to the international, you know, conference or seminar or like, uh, you know, Dr. Shinsha has mentioned about the G77, you know, forum or what kind of Like our friends here, Kunwalapa, I remember you, like, you know, you and, you know, your partner, like, try to, uh, you know, talk about the national gross happiness of Bhutan. Bhutan has its own development framework. I think I'm, 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 I'm proud to be Thai, that I mean, you know, and when I meet my like foreign friends, and I say that I have my own, my country has my own development framework, and it's obviously economy. I think that's that's just great. Okay, for example, but I would like to say more about because Jonathan asked about evidence, and we have evidence and lots of evidence. Um, besides this book that Nick Grossman just, you know, publishing out by the EDM, um, myself with other, uh, I'm, I'm academic, you know, I'm, I'm scholars, research all the time. Um, we are going to have a next book called Sufficiency Thinking, Thailand's gift, GIFT gift, to an unsustainable world. And when we saw the title of the book that Myself and my, you know, scholar's friend wrote, you know, we thought, wow, this is too much. <laughs> but because, you know, when, when, we, when we wrote, we finished this manuscript, we would put it on the market and to get bidding for publishing. And then uh, finally we go with Alan and Anwin, you know, we got offer from, should, should I tell this name? <laughs> I think we should not go through this, right? But anyways, like Springer, you know Springer Publishing House that, you know, published all the Nobel, you know, um, a lot of, you know, um, works, you know. They even bid for, to publish this book that we have wrote. All about evidence that if we use sufficiency economy, what would happen? You know, I, I wrote the chapter on education, which, which i tell you later. I just like to say that, you know, this book will be coming out in May and it will be used, you know, as a textbook for the graduate level for the whole world because, you know, Alan and I have been published and sell it, you know. Uh, and we intend to do that. We need case studies. We need showcases that we can prove scientifically that it works. And we've done that. Last time, you know, somebody asked me, you know, um, how long would it take to get this book out? And I answered 12 years since the, I think 12 years, no, sorry, 15 years since the, His Majesty had, you know, gave it to us, service economy. And I think Thai put it in many sectors to try to see whether it worked, and it worked. We have cases, we have, you know, like, I would like to say about um, our scientific quantitative you know, um, research on the improvement of scores, you know, educational score, your NT, GPAD, what kind of ever in Thailand, um, the behavior changes, you know, um, formulating skills, you know, thinking skills and something like that of students. When schools, you know, implement the service principles in their learning activities over five years, we have seen the differences, both qualitative and quantitative. And that's why we have cases to show to the world that it works scientifically. And it will be in the book, you know, in May. If FCC, you know, Rora, you do it again, we bring the book <laughs> in May and we do that. And we talk about that. We have cases in, like I mentioned, I work on education. We have cases in private sector, in agriculture, in community-based. You know, uh, Dr. Ari has done about 20,000 communities 
you know, compare between communities that apply some C economy in their, um, you know, development or in their, like, you know, um, community products, something like that. And it shows difference. If people use these principles, you know, you have to have knowledge and virtues as the conditions before you do things, as uh, Kunduk has just mentioned, you know. To me, moderation, reasonableness, prudence is all about, I think it's, it's a life that you live based on reality. You have to know yourself to be moderate. You have to know circumstances. And you have to know that things are always changing. You know, I won't go into details, but we have evidence that I think we can tell the world that this is what Nick has just put into one sentence. Thailand has its own sustainable development framework and it's called sufficiency economy and it works in Thailand. Thank you very much. I may just you. add a little bit more. Um, you asked a very difficult question. You asked what, you know, like we have a whole bunch of rich people who are not doing anything to try to change the country. Um, it's true. And same goes everywhere in the world because, you know, currently we value greed more than other value. Uh, I think, as I said, people tend to associate sufficient economy with people who live in a rural area. Uh, one of the main reasons why is because we have a lot of examples that can, that can directly relate to issues that are faced in the rural economy. Things like um, in even distribution of uh, income uh, or, or opportunities, um, uh, jobs, uh, environment recreations, and things like that. And if and you look in, in the case of Thailand, um, I will now talk about His Majesty the King. He spent 40 years doing this work nonstop on trying to better the lives of the people in the rural communities. There are many different projects that can be learned from, not to copy, but to learn from and adapt. So if you, you have to be more specific when you talk about what Thailand can, can, can offer. If you talk about um, soil, Im soil improvement, do you need to talk about reforestation? You want to talk about bad, bad chai lane. Mangrove. Mangrove. You want to talk about uh, water purification. So there are a lot of examples that, that I think Thailand can offer. And I think that is um, something that um, the people at the foreign ministry are, are trying to do at this point. Um, I just went to a meeting with them regarding what, what Thailand can do with the G77 chairmanship. And I think one, one thing that Thailand can share is precisely these points. And what, what we have to do is we, we cannot force Fed sufficiency economy. It has to be believed based on evidence. And there are plenty of evidence. I, I think it would be very difficult to try to match any countries in the world that has have worked over 40 years uh, in, in rural development and achieve uh, uh, outcome in the scale that Thailand has achieved. Now, if you look at for Thailand 40 or 50 years ago compared to Thailand today, if you look at agriculture 40 years ago compared to agriculture today, it has improved significantly. If you look at the, 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 the strength of the community that are affected, you know, you, you, you see the lives of the people who are now empowered. They're thinking about their future. They're planning for their children, you know, and, and things like that. They're, 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 they are more proud to share what they have accomplished. And that's something that we, I, I have seen. <laughs> that's something that I have witnessed in my time working at the foundation. And it's, it's 10 years. Okay, so we'll, we'll see it. We'll live to see it. But that's, that is something that Thailand has to offer. But again, it's not a complete package. It's not 100% replicable programs, right? And it's something that Thailand needs to learn as well. Whenever I go work abroad, there's always some, some new things that I can take on, some, some, some new lessons that I can also learn. So we're talking about sharing experiences in, in, in the Thai context, bringing people to see because you can talk about you know, the, the principle of, of sufficiency economy and it will be very difficult for people to grasp. But if you bring them to Thailand to experience, to exchange with the people who their lives has been transformed, I think that is a more convincing way of promoting the principle. Yes, it's very common sense. And you know, something that I, I believe has been said that common sense is, is the, the most difficult to achieve. Because we are, we, we are so motivated by different other motives, right? Greed is one of the biggest issues, and that's why, you know, I mean, for the rich family, I, I, I can vouch for them that they are thinking about it. 
They have yet to act on it. They just think about it. And they've been thinking about it for the past 10 years, I think. So we have to wait until you know, they get their things together. Perhaps it's time to uh, ban the import of Ferraris, which are clearly not a bit more than sufficient. There was another question, please. Can you identify yourself as well, please? Yes, hi. My name is Drew Henkels. Um, I'm going to preface this comment by saying that I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. I uh, come from Brooklyn, New York, and I've only been in Bangkok for two and a half years. So take this for what it's worth. Um, but Jonathan, you asked, why should the world care about what Thailand is doing in terms of sustainable development? To me, if you are aware of journalism and, and, and television entertainment, factual entertainment, as many people may be here in this audience tonight since it's FCCT, there's a phenomenon called leapfrogging. And what's go what goes on with leapfrogging, particularly in Southeast Asia, is that there's a whole step that is skipped by developing countries. So essentially, if you're looking at how media is consumed and where it's distributed, right? In Malaysia, in, in, in Thailand, th these things are being, people are going straight to mobile phone use, okay? So I'm, I'm talking about a very specific niche of uh, this leapfrogging phenomenon. But I also believe that that is absolutely applying here in Thailand. For me, I see things that, in my mind, are way ahead of the states, way ahead of the states. People already know how to farm. Many people know how to farm. Many, many people are already, have grown up around that or, or are aware of it, right? Are aware that food comes from the ground or from animals that live. This is an awareness that's not quite there in the states and it might take decades to sort of reverse. So to me, asking why should people take it seriously, um, I think it's absolutely uh, very, very, very serious here. And it, there, there really is the potential for it to just become more uh, part of the norm here than anywhere else, really, that I've visited personally. Um, do you have a question for the panel? I do. I'm sorry. That would be bad form to just come to the mic with an answer instead of a question. I do have a question. Um, the question is, particular to education, what type of friction and resistance do you actually come across in terms of implementing this in the curriculum? Is it, is it from teachers? Is it from the kids? Is it from corporate you know, interest of any sort? I'm curious what type of gravity you face as you try to do that. Can I go first? Because yeah. I'm the most recently graduated out of the whole group. <laughs> Uh, I think with, with education, um, we need to really improve our education big time. Uh, we, as a student, we are taught to remember, not to rationalize. And that tends to stick with, 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 with our kids. So if you, if, if you don't teach kids to be innovative, to think outside the box, to rationalize, then uh, they are, they are no different than, than as, uh, a trained mouse or a house cat or whatever, right? Because they will do according to what they have been told to do or remembered to do. They cannot do anything beyond that. So in, 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 in for, for, for education, in that is the aspect that we need to improve the most. Um, I, I struggle with this concept because I wanted my, 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 my kids to go to the same school that I, that I have gone through. And it has the same, like, approach of kind of like a, um, I would say North, Kochai, Kochai. Pong, North Korea. Pong, uh, Kochai, Kochai. Okay. It's <laughs> more like a North Korean style where they would just preach to like something, love something and not not to understand and then come to the conclusion whether they like or dislike it, right? So that we I, we decided to send our kids to an alternative school to attend something that is different that, that would that, that, that would broaden their mind. So the foundation of the country built on the next generation, and that's what we need to improve, and that is something that I think a lot of the people are now paying attention towards. However, the system is more difficult, because when you look at the, the uh, Ministry of, 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 of Education, it's, it's extremely difficult to try to, uh, how do you say, upgrade uh, the current teachers. You can't just do a 2.0 software and just Bluetooth them and the next day they would run differently. So it, it takes time. And I, I think this is something that we will continue to face the next 20 or 30 years. Yeah, um, it's a long journey about education. 
and we have to be patient and just, you know, perseverance and just work on it. I, I think we have to admit that um, the level of quality of Thai education is really low in a, in a, among Asian countries, you know. Maybe it's even lower than Laos, Cambodia. Okay, we can be like very low. <laughs> but to improve that, there's no magic. And what we have tried to do is that, you know, Kunduk just mentioned that the educational system in Thailand before tried to make students memorize things. But how can we prepare students to cope with, you know, the changing world? They have to know how to think. So sophistic thinking is the framework of thinking that we try to, at least, you know, it can be even more ways of thinking, but at least, you know, for example, if they're going to do some project, you know, what kinds of resources that they have in hand, they have to use it, you know, in a moderate way, you know, think about what they have first, you know, live in your means. They have to think about reasons why they do this, why they don't do that, and they have to think about the risk or changes that may happen that make their project are not going to be complete as they expect. Just only these three principles that we make students, you know, think before they do the project, it has changed so many things. Okay, this is what we aim it to happen. But it can't go to students unless teachers change the way they teach first. So teachers have to think first <laughs> in the way, sufficiency way. So that's why I say it's a long journey. And um, many people ask me, you know, when, you know, like, you know, your friend, Dr. Chan, you ask me whether he can see any change in his own lifetime or something like that. I think we have to answer, but we just have to do it. If you don't do it, I think we just go lower and lower in educational education. But what I just uh, reported to you that we have, we have done, you know, quantitative um, research on what happened if teachers, we have to start from teachers first. Of course, we need, you know, support, you know, from uh, principals and educational district, but that's not that so much important as teachers. Once teachers understand social thinking and they apply it into their learning activities, it can create real change in school. And sufficiency thinking or sufficiency behavior can be learned through role models. You know, people, I know you would talk about teachers' debt. <laughs> teachers do not manage, you know, um, their own financial wealth. But anyways, but um, we have to have teachers to understand practices in their lives they can be role models and they apply in their teaching activities. Mm -hmm. So that's why I say that, you know, it takes us about, well, right now about 12 years. We have been working on educational curriculum, activities, and everything. But we still see, you know, um, not much of a groundbreak of examples. But we start seeing the right directions that we can follow. And it's, I think it will be the, the next decade that we would do it, you know, penetrate it to, to the whole country. Yeah. <laughs> that's enough, thanks. You had, that's it, no, thank you. No, no, I'm saying okay. <laughs> Can we have the next question, please? Hello, um, my name is Jeremy Colson. Um, I'm doing a, a, a Master's in Sustainability and Environmental Management at Harvard. Um, Jonathan asked me before the uh, meeting started, in fact, if I would ask some intelligent questions and I'm not really sure if I have got anything particularly intelligent but um, I, I was wondering um, th this has been quite an education for me um, li listening to the, the, these panelists this evening I've learned a lot but I'm just wondering if in addition to engage trying to well not trying succeeding in fact if you've got 18,000 schools already um, trying to work along the principles that you're, you're proposing. Um, I, I would call that a, a, a pretty successful start. But in addition to working through the, the um, educational system, um, are you also working through the, the Sankha, the, the, the Thai religious, Buddhist 
religious system. And my second question is, in what way do you feel that the SEP does intersect with, 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 with Theravada Buddhism? Thank you. <laughs> Who fancies that one? Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I, uh, not really, uh, but my wife is. So I learned from her through this osmosis process. When I, I mentioned, you know, this uh, principle of the new uh, economy, the fifth model, the fifth wave, you know, and I mentioned about Mathieu uh, Rica, who has really introduced this uh, element, what you call altruism, into the uh, uh, economic paradigm. And that is a real, you know, a Buddhist principle. You see, altruism. And then you have to, you know, translate that and adapt it to the, uh, the, 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 the real economy. So the tool is there. And this is back to why Thailand, uh, why Thailand could be, the, we, we, we don't need to be the, but at least we can claim that we, we provide the tool and whoever want to use it, pre feel free to use it. And they may use it better than us, the tool maker. That's, that is quite normal. The, but this uh, sufficiency economy has uh, Buddhist element built into it through this principle of altruism. OK. Um. I'm a Deravadan practitioner. <laughs> and actually, I live out from the forest monastery myself. Okay. And when I learned about these three principles, my first question is, why three, not two, not four, not five? What do we have more than this? What do we have less than this, right? It has to have reasons. Okay. So I try to contemplate on this moderation, you know, reasonableness, and prudence or self immunity. <coughs> whether it has any connection with um, Buddhist teachings. And I thought that, wow, the Buddha has taught on the three defilements. Greed, how can we reduce greed? We are not all go to, to Nirvana, right? <laughs> Which is gonna work in our daily life. But at least, you know, to reduce greed, maybe we should think about moderation. And how about, you know, hatred, you see? Then we have to think, why we hate other people? Maybe we have no good reasons. We don't have knowledge about that person that much. That will stand them. If we really understand why they do this and those and that, but they say those and this and that, we have reasons, then maybe we can reduce hatred. And the last one is delusion. Delusion is that we don't really see the world as it is. Which is, which is always you know, changing all the time, right? This is anicca in, in Buddhist teaching. So if we see the world that is always changed all the time, we thought that you know, we're gonna have cool, cool weather you know, on Monday, but now today is really hot. It's always changing. So we have to prepare ourselves for all the changes. So um, prudence you know, or self immunity is the principle that prepares to be awakened from delusion. When I found these answers, I think I, I'm in peace with myself, but please don't believe me. Just think about it, and maybe we can talk about it later. Thank you very much. Are there other questions, please, Jeremy? Okay. Hello, um, my name is Gillian Story. Um, I'd like to preface as well that I'm not very knowledgeable about the sufficiency economy, and I'm certainly not an expert on Thailand. Um, I am a teacher, though, and I do try um, to teach what I can about sustainability and living within your means. Um, um, Dr. Jingjai and um, Dr. Priyana, you mentioned about a journey. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask the panel if you really think that Thailand is on a journey towards sufficiency economy or away from it. Because from speaking from my own perspective, um, when I first visited Thailand 20 years ago, I actually felt that Thailand and surrounding countries were a lot better than Western countries where I was from on living within your means, 
being aware of the environment around you and being resourceful, using what you have, and living by Buddhist principles, such as you just described. But I really feel, having come back now here to work, a lot of that's gone. Um, and the people I spend time with don't really seem to follow that model anymore. Um, so I'd like to ask you what you think about that and examples. Um, I mean, examples I can think of is just the growing plastic and other garbage. Um, a dam on the Mekong produces enough energy for three shopping malls, aircon, and things like that. Um, so I'd like to ask that question and also um, a genuine question because I have no idea um, how many Thai people and especially Bangkok people um, would you say think of the sufficiency economy really or know much about it mm. thank you is Thailand going backwards do people in Bangkok ever think about it <laughs> no I, I think what your, your, your question is very really pertinent when uh, well I think uh, as I say, the, the uh, uh, sufficiency economy has stayed quite some time as a philosophy, as a philosophy, and then we start to implement. And uh, I would say, we are not getting away from the sufficiency economy. We are moving towards that because the lesson we learn from the crisis in, uh, you know, in. 1997 or the uh, crisis, uh, the financial crisis in 2008, you know, the uh, uh, kind of uh, now economic crisis in China, you know, the, the potential meltdown of the global economy is there as, uh, to show, you know, as a very concrete uh, warning. So I think we are, we are, we, we are, we are realize, I, I think everybody realize that. But then we just happen to have this, uh, you know, thing out of this uh, tool, economic tool, which we are now uh, put in work. But as I say earlier, we may be a s slow mover, but we are walking toward that, uh, that the destination would, could be, would, would be a, uh, uh, you know, country uh, we share economy, you know, the share possibility. I think that I cannot tell you how long it be, but we should at least people like myself in the private sector we should participate in the journey. I give you an example. You know, when you mentioned about Kunjalan, his eldest son now is heading this uh, committee on to build the. Uh, grassroots economy, the, the community uh, economy, you know, the micro-economy, it's the Kitanla. So he heading that committee to get here with, uh, I think, Jeno Anupong, who is the Minister of Interior. So they are working to, to what, this building up of this grassroots economy. So we are doing it. Now how long it will take? You see, I, 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 I cannot tell. I hope I can see it during my lifetime. That. Do you have any other thoughts to the rest of the panel on that? Because I would have argued, I'd agree with the panelists there. I don't see sufficiency being applied by very many people. The projects you're all involved in are, are wonderful in themselves, but they're quite small. Uh, and it seems you know, people could quite understandably say, this is all talk, but it's not really got traction with Thailand yet. Um, I, I, I agree with you. I, ask my, I, say, I often ask, do we head towards it or far away from it? But you can't ask that question in the context of Thailand and pretend everything remained constant 30 years ago. It's not fair. Let's ask the same question to Europe, to the US, to the Middle East, to South America. What would be your answer? <laughs> but does Thailand have anything special to offer in that case? Or are you just the same as everyone else? Well, I think we have something to offer. The fact that we have a lot of projects, some big, some small, a lot of community who are still resilient, is one of the ways that we can uh, provide 
example to the world. It's not perfect. We are fighting with capitalism. And it's very difficult to win when one side value is monetary. The other side is more or less goodness. Yes, you can't eat goodness. You can't buy a luxury with goodness. And I think that, that is something that we have to really talk about. Right? So we are saying that Thailand, by, led by His Majesty the King, has a lot of experiences in trying to provide uh, better quality of life to the people and the communities. For the, for the ones that we have been engaging for the past 30 or 40 years, they are still there. They are still prudent. They are still sustainable. But for the ones that are not, is not so good at a higher level of debt, uh, larger income disparity, less um, community togetherness, cannot come together for decision making. I think if you look at it in, 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 in a re reverse term, it helps slow the creep of capitalism. But at the end of the day, I still don't see any model in this world that can fight with capitalism. Nothing. You look at Michael Potter's creating shared values. How many American firms, schools, has done that? They talk about it. Taught everywhere. How many has done it? So let, let's, let's, I think, let's go a little bit easy on Thailand. We are talking about a principle that we are trying to uh, implement. And it's something that it's, it's, we have some success, small success. It's a journey. Journey has its up and down. And sometimes we need a little bit of a push. Something like the world on the brink of breaking down, or humanity existence at stake. Maybe we'll take sufficiency economy a little bit more seriously. <laughs> Please, I just um, submit. Yes, Sorry. See, um, I have my experiences in, in, in educational sector. I don't know anything else in other sector. Um, I think there's, there's a, a law on something we call tipping point. You know, if you are going to do, uh, create any social change, we have to have some amount of number that people do that. And when we reach the tipping point, we can change the whole society. And basically, they would say something about, you know, 25% or 30%, something like that. Anyways, I, I have experienced myself. We started, uh, you know, putting these service economy principles into schools like this is like from the year 2007, so nine years, right? The very first five, six years, it was really difficult, very slow. But once we reach, you know, something like 10,000, it starts to change the mood of people in educational sector. And now, when we have about 18,000, every school that are not taking seriously about some of principles, to put in their school curriculum. They are going to be minority soon. So now it's, 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 trend, it's trendy in educational sector that you have to do something based on service economy in school. So I think the law works in this case. I don't know about any other sector, but in education, you know, we, we, we don't need any advertisement, anything at all. But it's just that, you know, when schools around you, they're all like, you know, applying service economy of thinking in their learning activities and you know everything and you are not doing that they start to think and change we may take you know about I don't know five six years to to go like you know until we reach the last school that are not doing that or I don't know maybe ten years I know but and we have to go to climb up the quality level too but that's we have to work on so I think the answer that is is you know is up to us you know Kundu. Whether the economy is going to go away or be in Thailand, if Thai people still doing that, I think we are going to make it happen. <laughs> yeah. I like to follow what uh, you say, the tipping point. Yeah, I, I think um, Thailand has been developed under the concept of capitalist for how many years? You 60, know, 70. Yeah. 60, 70 years. How can we imagine uh, with you know small number, we are still minority to implement this uh, throughout the country, and with the bombard of all the advertising, you know we are we, we have the freedom, business have the freedom, so we still you know struggling and fighting. But I think it will come to the tipping point one day because 
now we accumulate. Uh, what, what she said, the 20-25% is the critical mass to change things. And I think um, we have also learned and try to uh, find the right model to promote. Um, for example, I have, uh, you know, last year I started a project we call in Thai Kongra Khuntin, means uh, um, encourage the brave people to go back home, to go back hometown. And, you know, that is against all these, uh, you know, the attitude of the, of the society to go back hometown. Uh, and new generation, they have a three obstacle, major obstacle. First of all, they ask, can they live their life? Can they have enough money to send uh, their children for a good education? Secondly, how can they overcome the negative attitude from the family and the village, the, the whole village, we say, you know, you stupid. You know, you you throw away, you know, hundred thousand bucks rally and come back to be a farmer. And third, in their whole life, they never be, you know, doing agriculture. I try. We recruit seven hundred eighty people uh, to be trained. We don't train them uh, as usual. We let them think and let them, you know enlighten themselves uh, what would they do with a small part of land. We have a lot of sample, but you choose what context that suit you most. And then they plan themselves and we provide uh, the you know the coach. We also use the, uh, to build them a, a network and a teamwork uh, to you know uh, to to have a peer group for themselves to start after the project, uh, you know, after the training, 730 went back. Out of 780, highest ever. And after five months, we you know, follow up. 666 say we survive. We can survive. And those people are space engineer, you know, chair from abroad, come back. You know, they are high caliber people. These are the people who we will use them as a model, a role model, an idol to bring, uh, to be a chain agent to, and most of them have, have the good number of fan page. 500, uh, 1,000, 4,000, 200,000 fan page. We need a number, we need a, a critical mass to, you know, to transform uh, this kind of attitude. We need the positive attitude. Young generation, if they don't have positive attitude, <coughs> they won't do. And secondly, they need an idol. Thirdly, they need a coach to help them through. So this also the, the testing model. We're doing a so-called social lab to try to find the right model to scale up. So we are doing that. and. We hope we will achieve that because we are, we are having 70% um, uh, seven, of the children who drop out from formal education out there. If we don't take taking good care of them, they will, you know, go, you know, they have no future, so to say. So I think we, we have many good examples, but we need good uh, number, we need critical mass to transform this. Thank you. Can I make this the last question, please, Mark? Because time's getting on here. Yeah. yeah, just one quick, I'll make it quick then. Um, just one quick question. You've talked about the importance of education. You've talked about the tipping point. Someone, someone who believes the tipping point is much nearer than we think. Could it be accelerated by regulation, which has not been mentioned this evening? I'm thinking Thailand has a good example here. Here's a country with a lot of sunshine that could be generating so much more of its own electricity rather than being on the verge of importing coal from South Africa or Angola to build coal-fueled power stations near tourist resorts. Yet, we don't have a solar energy on the scale that we could have 
because of problems, political problems and regulatory problems, particularly over the feed-in tariff. Why isn't regulation being used to drive standards? Why do you seem to be relying on a voluntary model which will always delay? Thanks. Good point. No, <laughs> as a private sector, I can tell you that we're working very hard on this. With the public sector, we, we have come up with very concrete recommendation on ease to do business in Thailand. And I think uh, we, uh, we are moving quite fast. But then, you know, you have to, to, we have to reform the mentality of civil servants, which is not uh, quite easy. But I think they, 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 they have to change. Well, because the, whoever, <laughs> the power will be, just really want the change. So I think the, this, this, this will be coming, ease of doing business. I will, you will see it in within the six months, perhaps. Isn't the truth that uh, when it comes to regulation, vested interests get involved? If you look at your telecom sector, if you look at your solar power sector, they haven't progressed because the regulations are hopeless. In fact, in those, uh, those areas, Thailand's a long way. I mean, it's an example because regulation really can change yeah, behavior. Yeah, yeah. No, some already change, you know, like the permit to set up the factory now is, you know, it's a change from two, three months to about two, three days. But you're very good at regulations that set up factories, but not so good at regulations that change people's behavior to becoming more sustainable. <laughs> cannot tell people to be sustainable. <laughs> <laughs> no, regulations change so behavior. Right, I mean, yes. They do, I and mean, we, you we just, know this. You just give them the tool, but you have to work it out themselves. Yeah. Oh, okay, one quick question. Yeah, sorry. Thanks for indulging me. Uh, my name's Mark French. I work with a company called the Beaumont Partnership. We set up a foundation about five years ago, built a school up at Chayapum. Um, we may have a case study that um, we can discuss with the panellists after this. Yeah. I'd be delighted if you could. Yeah, the panellists would be available for that. Thanks very much. Thank I'd like to thank our four panellists uh, uh, for a really interesting topic of conversation. I hope none of you felt inhibited in asking anything that you wanted to do. Thank you very much. <laughs>